I just want to thank you guys for the opportunity to share uh, the mountain pine beetle work that we are doing in Custer State Park and, and just to share with you guys the successes that we that we did have over the last season. Um, so I'm really just going to spend time in two areas, just kind of a brief review of all the work we have done in the past and then focusing more on, on last year and, and this year where we've kind of expanded our efforts. So no good Custer State Park beetle presentation would be complete without a review of what we've done in the Sylvan Lake area. This is kind of where we started um, and it still continues to be a major part of our efforts. So when we say uh, the Sylvan Lake unit, it's basically this uh, 3,000 acre piece that comes off the northwest corner of the main body of the park. And kind of for this review, a little different than something we've shown in the past, but I'm just going to show a, sh a series of maps. And on the first one, it's, it's basically going to have these red splotches on the map, and those are red top trees uh, that are um, shown from aerial or revealed from aerial photography. So the map up there on the upper left-hand corner, you see 2004 red. So this is uh, what we were looking at from an air photo in 2005 showing uh, red top trees in 2004. So 2004 and 2005 were really just years where we were first starting to see the problem. Uh, we weren't really beginning our work uh, full scale. Um, you can kind of see, or I forgot to point out to the north here, is the Black Elk Wilderness. And then on the southern portion of the boundary uh, is the Norbeck Wildlife Preserve. So 2004, 2005, we weren't doing a whole lot of work. Um, 2006 <clears throat> was a little bit of a shift. We did do some preliminary uh, cut and chunk work, and we were starting to do some thinning along the boundary. Uh, 2007 was the major shift. Uh, this is where we began traversing the entire unit, treating every single infested tree. And as some of you will probably remember, we did the uh, buffer thinning uh, that we got the special appropriations for along the entire boundary. And you can start to see here too in, in this 2007 photo, the wilderness was really starting. This is when it was really starting to explode and, and just was apparent that um, was going to be more than just a little problem. Uh, 2008 again, uh, you can see, you know, within the boundaries of the park, uh, very little red top trees again because we were treating them all. Um, this east side in the um, cathedral spires, Needles Country was, was again showing significant expansion, just ext extreme amounts of pressure. Uh, 2009 was actually kind of a, a little bit of a let off. Again, there was so much pressure here and, and, and basically it was all dead. Um, it kind of shifted a little bit here to the east. We, we did start to see pressure building over here along the west. Uh, 2010, it, it did expand the pressure directly adjacent to our boundary, again, the west, and then more in this uh, neck portion. Uh, 2011, this is our, our most recent photo. Um, you can pretty much see the entire north and east section here is, is pretty much dead on the wilderness side, uh, but we are still seeing some pressure along the south and again in the neck. So just kind of summarizing year by year, uh, how many infested trees we treated just in the Sylvan Lake unit. Again, 2005, 2006 were pretty low, 3,800 3, trees in 2006. And we saw this increase in 2007, 2008, and then in 2009 we saw pretty much hopefully what we s is the top of the top of the chart here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, one thing I do want to point out here, uh, in 2009 and 2010, uh, we used a helicopter to remove every infested tree within that unit. <clears throat> Basically, as the you know concerns uh, were mounting over fuel loading and just the aesthetics of all these chunks along trails and right around the lake and, and all that stuff, the decision was made uh, for two years there we used a helicopter. And what I'll point out is then in, in 2010, that was the year I said it was a light year, uh, as far as pressure on the outside, the tree number dropped to 10,500. Well, of course, the first thing we thought was, well, that was the year we used the helicopter and, and removed every single tree. And then in 2011, we saw it spike back up, despite the fact that we had removed every single tree. We knew that every single one of these was basically coming from the outside. So while we were keeping the population at bay within the boundaries, the biggest factor was actually the, just the pressure from the outside. Uh, this is again just showing that air photo with the actual aerial imagery. Uh, here's Sylvan Lake and, and the lodge right here. Again, just kind of showing, you know, this, this is basically 
what we're up against. I mean, it's been since 2003, 2004. So we're talking eight, nine years here. You know, I think a lot of us kind of thought this thing would tail off a little bit before now as far as just just the Sylvan Lake unit, not even onto the main body of the park yet. But it is still an issue and, and is still a lot of pressure. So obviously one of the main questions we have and, and a lot of people have is, you know, is it working? Is it paying off? Uh, what are we seeing in return for our investment? Uh, this is just a <clears throat> simple table showing pine tree mortality as caused by mountain pine beetle in trees per acre. So in 2005, the Sylvan Lake area was at pretty similar levels to the wilderness at three trees per acre, 12 trees per acre, pretty similar um, from a, a forest perspective. 2008, we really started seeing separation um, in the Sylvan unit, just 11 trees per acre as compared to the 48, so over four times as many trees on an individual acre affected by mountain pine beetle. And then in 2011, um, the gap widened even further to five times as many dead trees in the wilderness as in, as in the Sylvan Lake unit. And it's pretty safe to say that if, if we would have done nothing, we would have been right here. You know, 178 trees per acre, just for perspective, is, is pretty much your whole overstory. I mean, they, there are still some seedlings, smaller trees alive, but that is basically the majority of your overstory. So kind of shifting gears a little bit, that was just a little summary of mainly Sylvan Lake. So kind of shifting gears to where we were at uh, one year ago, about this time. And <clears throat> this was, again, an air photo showing... Uh, red top trees again a lot of the main pressure around Sylvan Lake but again you, as you can see starting to expand along our our north boundary and a little bit along the west and then also we started beginning to see red top trees showing up in within the main body of the park uh, this is when the decision was made to do a, a ground survey just to try to get an actual little better estimate of how many trees we had uh, this estimate uh, revealed that there was up to 146,000 infested trees in the park. Uh, this is when the decision was made also to to seek more funding. Uh, the governor approved the use of emergency funding and, and basically as part of his part of his uh, beetle initiative um, and in combination with Department of Ag and, and Game Fish and Park funding, the decision was made to basically expand this effort out to the whole park, uh, cover the entire park, identify and mark every infested tree and, and treat them. So this is a summary of what we did last year, fiscal year 2012. Uh, luckily, um, we didn't end up at 146,000 trees. The estimate was a little high. Uh, we ended up at 100,000. Um, and of those 100,000, we removed 55,000 and cut and chunked 45,000. So basically where we could get a log skidder to, where it was accessible, we just removed the tree, um, removes 100% of the beetles, removes the fuel loading and, and all those concerns. But where we couldn't, uh, we employed the cut and chunk tactic. To get this accomplished, took 14 crews, uh, mainly private contractors. We had nine of them. Uh, we also had four wildland fire suppression crews and one Department of Corrections inmate crew. Uh, something I'll talk a little bit more on further slide is this. Uh, we also thinned 667 acres. This was mostly in an effort to do a similar type buffer along more of the northwest boundary of the main body of the park. Uh, we also prepared 2,500 acres of commercial timber sales, which I'll talk more about here in a minute. Uh, this is a table showing the cost summary for fiscal year 2012. Uh, the grand total for all this treatment was two, almost $2.2 million. Uh, the majority of that was just direct treatment of the trees themselves, almost $1.6 million. Um, the, the buffer thinning... 244000 was the other major expense, and then 336000 and just additional costs, most of that in marking. It does, we had to hire um, 16 or maybe a few more people, you know, just to traverse the entire park, mark, identify, and, and so we could get the trees to contractors. And again, you know, bringing up that Sylvan Lake was about 25% of the effort, so about half a million of that 2.2, again, was just invested in the Sylvan Lake unit. And just a whole, from the whole beginning, FY5 to 2012, uh, 3.7 million in total cost. So again, this is our most recent photo. 
So this is what we just took uh, last August, September. Um, and again, you know, we can actually see the pressure is really picking up north boundary and then the entire west boundary on the other side um, is, is basically going to be where we're at for a while. Um, and then you can see in the main body of the park, um, pretty minimal. Over the whole time period, or just last year, 3.7 million. Um, so again, this year we did a, a ground survey, and this year's estimate is at 46,000. And I'll go to this slide. So this, you know, for us, this is a major success. I mean, basically in one year to go from a total of 100,000 trees down to 46,000. You know, so basically a 54% reduction in one year's worth of efforts, and even um, a a bigger difference, again, I'll break this out to the main body versus Sylvan Lake. In Sylvan Lake, we only saw a 30% reduction. You know, again, kind of saying that the, we can't, even if we deal with our problem in that unit, a, a big um, effect here is what's coming on the outside. But in the main body of the park, that re rest of the 34,000 acres of forest land in Custer State Park, we had a 61% reduction. And 30,000 trees on 34,000 acres of ground is less than one an acre, which is basically uh, endemic status by, by most metrics. So basically, we knocked it back really well. So this is a, a summary of, of what we are going to accomplish uh, through this fiscal year. Most of this stuff has already started, and, and we've done quite a bit of it. Uh, again, we had the estimate of 46,000. Um, we will plan again to remove about 50% of the trees where we can, and we will cut and chunk about 50% of the trees. Uh, much less of a workforce needed just because of the lower number of trees. Uh, eight private contractors, uh, three of these will do the removal work, and five to do the cut and chunk. And to date, we have marked 28,000 trees on 12,000 acres, and of those, we've already treated 7,500. So this is kind of a, a busy map showing some of that thinning and commercial timber sale work I talked about. Uh, these pink ones here are that buffer thinning work we did in 2007. Um, the yellow and green are those commercial timber sales. You know, one of the main um, advantages we have in the main body of the park is the terrain is not as rough. Uh, it's much more conducive to the commercial timber sale, which is where uh, we are being paid for the removal of green timber. Definitely um, by far most effective tool most cost efficient and it's basically what we're trying to do here is create more of a landscape thinned area or area at a lower risk. Uh, the blue areas are, are non-commercial thinnings that we are doing just directly adjacent to boundary just to adjacent to the boundary just to complete the the buffer. And just one last thing um, I want to share with you guys I, I don't know how many of you have heard the um, recent decision uh, that the Forest Supervisor Craig Bobzine made in their, they call it their Pine Beetle Response Project. Um, but, but basically what it is, is these, all these green areas on the map is they took <clears throat> every stand that they considered to be at a high risk for mountain pine beetle attack that was not currently under an existing project went, went into this, this project and they did the NEPA and all the environmental analysis, public scoping and all that. They did ex exclude the wilderness and the Norbeck. And so basically it's 200, about 250,000 acres. And what this allows them to do is if they go out into the woods and find a beetle patch, they can remove it, treat it however they want without doing all the environmental analysis that's, that's really slowed them down. So, you know, so most, a lot of areas in the forest, they do have projects already set up where they can do uh, beetle tree removal. Uh, the, you know, the main impact obviously for this is gonna be Black Hills National Forest wide wide, but we do have um, some of these areas uh, directly adjacent to our west boundary that will allow them the freedom to, to treat beetle trees, which, which should um, be beneficial for us. So that's all I have. If you guys have any questions, <clears throat> my voice is a little hoarse. We did a prescribed burn yesterday, so I ate a lot of smoke. Adam, why don't you stay put, or, and, and Matt, I Put you on your spot, but could you or or Gary bring us up to date on that prescribed burn yesterday? That was uh, a big activity, and I think worth just 
spending a couple minutes on while we're on the subject of forestry. I'll let Jerry Jerry's <coughs> No, for Adam. Is there, I've heard theories that as you work hard to control um, and thin trees mm -hmm. within the park that, that may concentrate that particular swarm of beetles that may have found trees inside now are actually going to the outside and that that would increase the pressure um, outside in the forest. Is there any, any truth to that or has that been studied uh, at all to see if in fact you know, what you're doing basically is kind of creating an inhospitable, inhospitable location and then get kind of a lure crop of trees out outside that are susceptible to Sure. I mean, generally, <clears throat> generally speaking, a beetle doesn't like to fly more than 300 feet. So if, if they're way interior and we chunk them or remove them or whatever, the majority of those beetles aren't going to make it, you know, outside the boundary. Um, but, I mean, yes, it would... It would make it more hospitable, more appealing to the beetles, all that, that thick forest along the boundary, but it, it would basically explode or it, it would get eaten by beetles anyway. You know, so what we're doing is reducing the risk so that even when that, when that chunk of forest along the edge is expanding, it is blowing up, to try to reduce the amount of impact inside the boundary. So it doesn't really, it wouldn't necessarily lure them out, let them build up and come back in it's gonna build up on the outside no matter what because there's so many beetles on the outside. They, they don't need our beetles. Our beetles are insignificant compared to, you know, what, especially like I said, that 30,000 trees on 34,000 acres, you know, it isn't, is, is a drop in the bucket. Is there any difference between the standard thinning distances that, um, uh, the Forest Service uses when they go in and do a timber sale and, and they're basically looking at spaces <coughs> versus what those spaces would be if you're actually trying to control beetles? Is there there's a different spacing, different uh, yep. more or less or what? Uh, you know, we use a, a fancy term called basal area, but it's, it's historically the Forest Service has treated their stands at a higher density throughout the, the, the vast history of their forest management program. Um, so... To, so um, just to, put, I guess, try to put in the best perspective I can, the norm for them was an 80 basal area. The, the kind of standard for a beetle type treatment like our buffer thinning is a 40 basal area, so about half. So, so much wider spacing. But even now, to date, the Forest Service is being more aggressive, um, whereas the park has historically been in more of a 60 basal area just for traditional forest management. And, and the Forest Service has shifted. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I have a question. Um, we were out in on the northern hills right after Christmas and skiing, and then we I, we were south of Deadwood, and I saw a bunch of slash piles that were burning in a snow area. Was that private or Forest Service or probably Forest Service? Okay. Um, I don't know for sure, but probably. it's good to see that some of that was going on. So they're getting after it a little more. Besides their study, they're starting to get some done. Sure, you know, and and. Again, um, not to beat up on the Forest Service too bad, I mean, they are very active. Uh, and actually, on a one and a half million acre forest, there are some years where they produce more commercial timber than any other national forest in the whole country, which is amazing considering the Pacific Northwest, you know, how, many, how much more volume they can grow on an acre versus what the, the, Nat the Black Hills can. So they are an active forest, they, they do do a lot. Um, but yeah, the, the problem is, is bigger than what they're doing for sure. Uh, has has it, what's the effect of drought on this? Is it make it more favorable or more active or what? What does that do? Is there or is there any effect? Maybe there isn't any effect. On sure. I mean the 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 jury is still out. I guess as far as why these things start exactly and why they stop because a lot of times they stop when it appears that the beetles would still have more food to eat so it's not 100 percent known i mean most most scientists would think that um, drought at the beginning of an epidemic would, would kind of be a cause to its starting i mean basically you're stressing the trees and if you stress them for multiple years um, you know the beetle would just be another stressing agent to basically an easily attacked host uh, as far as like this year um, I mean, one of the impacts we did see is that 
the actual pitch tubes on the trees are very hard to see. I mean, usually you have a big, you know, pitch mass about that big protruding off the side of the tree, whereas this year it's, it's pretty much just sawdust, like within a bark crevice. Um, but I, I guess as far as on a year-to-year -year basis, I think the conclusion is that it has more to do with the availability of food source. So again, that high density stands and lots of them in a large area, I think is, is more of the problem than, mm. than the drought. So uh, <clears throat> is there a natural cycle to this thing? Uh, if it were le left untreated, do you ever get out of the cycle or would it? I, you know, historically they, they usually don't tend to last more than 15, 20 years. I mean, that's kind of on the long end and we're getting towards that long end uh, but in other places, Colorado, Montana, I mean, they have seen it not stop until basically the majority of the trees are dead. Yeah. So this is um, just, we just got a, um, a table that we are putting together for the legislative briefing next week that shows this is the largest beetle epidemic on record, uh, now surpassing the one that was in the late 1800s, early 1900s, which was previously the largest one on record. So, I mean, historically, it looks like, you know, it should be just by time-wise, number of years should be coming to a close, but there's still plenty of food source left. I think your, your work is very dramatic in what, uh, you know, the success you've had. It's uh, pretty impressive. I mean, that's Thank a nice you. job. Any other questions? All right, thanks guys. Yeah, we've been at the Beetle thing for a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commission, um, I'll give you a quick little brief update on what we're going or what we've been doing with this prescribed fire. This is part of a complex that, of about six different blocks that are west of the airport there in the park. Uh, we've been working on getting those burned. It's a combination of some hardwood release, um, some, some prairie restoration, some, and as well as a lot of timber fuels clean up and some under, understory um, opening. Uh, this area was under con timber contract in the late in in around 2000, and that's in, some of you'll probably recall we had a big a big storm, uh, April snowstorm got 36 40 inches of snow wet snow had a lot of timber breakage. We did some modifications with the timber sales at that time, um, but we did get crews and DOC crews and everything else in there doing a lot of cleanup. Had a lot of piles. There's a lot of fuel on the ground in there, um, and th these units that we were working on, as well as um, some pre-commercial thinning, timber treatments, um, and the activity fuel from the timber sale. So one of the big um, objectives for this, for managing that timber in there was to get those fuels cleaned up. We needed to give it enough time for some of those fuels to break down so that fuel loads were low enough that we didn't kill the overstory that we'd been trying to release um, in the timber. And some research in the past has shown that that's somewhere in the vicinity of seven plus years and a seven inch and larger tree. And so we were at that point, that's when we put these prescriptions together. Uh, like I said, we've been working on these blocks for uh, the last two, two and a half years. Uh, we had a pretty good window here. We've done, of the, of the six blocks that were in there, we've burned uh, four and a half. And we had one unit that we were looking to complete, uh, about 60 acres, plus if conditions were good, we would do another 15 acres of this last block, uh, which is about 200 acres. And um, so we went through the ignition yesterday. This is a good time to do it. A lot of these were south-facing slopes. The snow's burned off. Still had a little bit of residual snow on those north-facing slopes outside the units, kind of as a protection against anything jumping the line. Um, got the fire going yesterday about, I think about 11 o'clock when they got in there and got some ignitions going. Um, got pretty smoky. Uh, the wind sh shifted a little bit later in the day. Um, they did go ahead and, and work to get that extra 15 acres of this second um, block burned. Um, things were going pretty good. Had a big wind shift later in the day. We did have some slop over. Uh, they were dealing with that. Um, as of this morning, I think we had about, there, uh, there was about 30 to 50 acres which had been slopped over into that, outside of that um, 15 acres into that other unit, the rest of unit two. That stuff's all in prescription. And uh, so the decision was made this morning to go ahead and complete the rest of that um, block two. So uh, they're up there today probably eating some more smoke. And, um, but the, the goal should be 
and the objective will be to go ahead and get the entire block done by the end of the day. That'll play well with the snow coming in tomorrow. Um, we'll be able to, to set on those things. And so things sound like they're going pretty good. Uh, it was a little chaotic yesterday for a while there. A um, lot smoky, but we had lots of resources on hand. Working with the Forest Service, uh, we had Forest Service personnel there, uh, as well as a lot of state wildland fire suppression guys. So we had, a, had, a, had lots of resources, plenty of cooperation going on, and, and things look pretty good. The total acres for this particular that'll be under fire with these two days will be about a hundred or about two hundred and fifty to two hundred and seventy. Um, the total, the total for this entire block of six units, is a little is about eight hundred and fifty. So, we had a, a good portion of it already done. One more item before break here. Mr. Chairman, the uh, final uh, information item that Parks has is our year-end reports uh, for the calendar year of 2012, and a lot of good news here to, to report. If you go to 11 in your booklet, I'll just uh, make a few comments on each one of these pages under 11. Uh, first of all, you'll see the revenue comparison by uh, license type, and you'll see there that uh, we're up 11.6% over last year. Last year, of course, was the flood year, uh, 2011, and we saw a drop, and, and we've more than recovered from uh, the problems that we, we had with the flooded areas last year. Uh, I know I've done this before, but one more time, I, I can't help but thank our staff and everybody involved with the flood recovery. Uh, we would have not been able to enjoy these these numbers, the the revenue, uh, bounce back or, or any of the other benefits if it hadn't have been for the early response and a lot of that work was accomplished before the park season ever started. So um, that is something that uh, all the credit goes to the field staff and, and for all of their efforts to, to get their parks back into shape. Uh, if you turn to 11A and look at it by district, uh, you'll see that obviously where we saw the biggest gains in terms of revenue was in those flood districts that had been hurt the year before. So it's pretty easy to see by looking at those percent changes uh, where in 2011 we were most affected by the flood. Uh, all of the areas uh, on the Missouri River, probably with the exception of uh, uh, some of the areas on Lewis and Clark, really saw a, a big nosedive in 11 and they came back last year in, in great shape. Uh, four of the five districts that lead the way in terms of uh, percentage increases, ranging from 19% to 127% uh, for the year, uh, came from the Missouri River areas uh, that were impacted by flooding. Uh, could look at the Palisades District that includes Lake Vermilion and see that that was uh, also a big bump this year, 16.9% increase in revenue there. And that's attributable to the Lake Vermilion Campground Expansion Project. We completed that the previous year. Last year was the first year that that facility was open and uh, it made a huge impact on that park and uh, was really well received by the public. Going on to 11B, uh, you'll look at our visitation report. It tracks right along with uh, all the other reports, both camping and, and, and revenue, we were up 11%. Uh, in our state parks and recreation areas, the, the main areas where we, the fee areas, if you will, the 60 areas listed here, or the uh, 30 areas that are listed here, we uh, had about 6.9 million visitors. Uh, the park system itself hosted another million visitors that are lakeside use areas. So they're not listed on this page, but we keep those in another set of records. So for the year, uh, our visitation for the state park system as a whole, not counting the Mickelson Trail or the snowmobile system, which we, we aren't able to keep the same kinds of visitation records for, topped out at 7.9 million. And that's, that's a new record uh, for, the, for the state park system. 
And then uh, the last page in this year-end reports is our uh, camping unit uh, report. And as you can see, we topped 270,000 camping units for the year. That's a new record. It's up 13.4% over last year, but more importantly, it's up 3% over our previous record year, which was 2010. So uh, I think in that, that year we were at about 262 or 263,000 units, which at that point was the best year we'd ever had. And then we dropped down last year to 238,000 due to the parks that were closed during the flooding. And, and now we came back in great shape. And that's in spite of the fact that the Fisher Grove campground was closed uh, on the Jim River. And, and one of the projects that is in our FY14 budget request, we talked to the Appropriations Committee about it today, would be to relocate that campground on the other side of the river uh, this coming spring. And uh, we'll be back to full, full strength then and, and have that one open again as well. So that will push the numbers even further next year. So with that, I'd, I'd answer any questions about the kind of year that we had in in 2012, I, I think it was a, a great year by all accounts, and uh, especially given what, what we were up against when, when 11 ended, uh, it exceeded expectations. With that, I thank you. All right, we'll a 15-minute break.